Uh, today, I'm going to continue with you all in this series that you have been in, uh, which you have entitled, I Am. And for the last several weeks, you've been looking at who we really are and what is our identity as it relates to what Scripture tells of who we are and what God says of who we are. You've been using the book of Ephesians as a guideline, and, and you've been taking an, an exegetical walk through Ephesians on this topic. And the series text for today is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, which says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This works really well on Mother's Day. Uh, but then it goes on to say, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Though it may go well, so that it may go well with you, that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. The reality that I was asked to highlight today is I am fathered. And in order for us to to work, continue on in a series about Ephesians, if this were just about the book of Ephesians, then this passage is very helpful because it's the next passage in Ephesians that you guys come to. Um, in order to talk to the topic of us finding our identity as children of God who are fathered by God, then we're going to venture to some other also texts that we're going to put alongside this so that we can paint a bigger picture, a more thorough picture of what does it look like for us to be fathered by God. Because this is an incredible reality of who God is. And A.W. Tozer wrote, what comes in our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Because this is the gravest question before the church, he says. It is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deepest heart conceives God to be like. The reality is, within every one of us, there is a gallery of images within our heart and our soul. We have a full gallery of images in our heart which our conceptions of God come from. And many of those images come from relationships that we have in our life. It comes from uh, particularly earthly relationships that we have with our earthly fathers. But it also comes in other relationships that we have that are close to us. Our images of God and who we perceive God to be and know God to be is critical to our spiritual well-being. The problem is that there are a significant amount of those images that are in our heart's gallery that are very distorted. And they're broken. Pictures. And we take all of these different experiences. We have this experience with this family member. We have this, this experience, this context that we have with our earthly father, with our earthly parents. We have this experience or this, um, this context that we come through, this relationship that we have, and we take all of those and then we project those onto who God is and they are all broken pictures. But we put them onto God and suddenly in our heart's heart, we begin to perceive God to be just like all of these distorted images that we've experienced throughout our life with different fathers, mothers, and other broken circumstances. The images of God that we hang in our heart's gallery influence us very mightily. And it's because these images are rooted in a deeper place. They're rooted in a deeper place where experiences have taken place and it is important that we recognize where are these distorted images coming from and we have to recognize why they're broken because they interfere with our ability to trust God and to speak with God and to walk with God because we have broken pictures of who he really is. It might look in any variety of ways, 
that these distorted images come from. Maybe you grew up in an experience, or maybe you are currently living in an experience where uh, it does, like, maybe you know that there is no way you'll ever meet your parents' expectations. It doesn't matter what you do. You could, give, you could graduate summa cum whatever, but because you didn't go to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever they wanted you to, it still was never enough. You could have grown up doing all the kinds of things that you did in, in sports or in performances. You could have had the perfect game, and yet still there would be something wrong with your stance. There would be something wrong with the way you did this. There's something wrong with the way you did this. There is a, this impossible expectation that you can just never meet. And then we take this image, this broken image, and we throw it onto God, and now God is impossible to please. I can never do enough. It seems like every time I climb the ladder, God adds another couple rungs, and I'm just never going to get there. It's a broken image that's made its way into our heart's gallery. Maybe you grew up in a situation that was abusive, physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is. It made your circumstance unsafe. And now all of a sudden we begin to take these circumstances that we've lived and we project those onto God, literally like there's a picture of who God truly is and then we have this projector that projects a broken image on top of it. And now we think God is abusive. God's just waiting to punish me, always. And a broken image has made its way into my heart's gallery. Perhaps... You grew up in a context that you have been left by someone who should have been there to be depended on. And maybe that was a father. Maybe it was a mother. Maybe it was anybody who should have been there for you to depend on. And they left you and they abandoned you. And the thing about when we get abandoned by somebody is that we start to think of a lot of what-if questions. We start to think, well, what if, I, what if I could change it? If I did this right, if I could do it better, maybe they'll come back. Maybe if I do it better, if I was just better, they would never leave in the first place. And we start to put their abandoning onto us. And all of a sudden, now we've projected this broken image on God, and we say, if I have to be good, I have to be better, I have to be better, I have to be better, or God won't leave me. Or maybe if I could just do it right, God will come back to me. A broken image, distorted image has made its way into our heart's gallery. And this is how we think God fathers us. I don't know what it is. There are so many different broken images that make their way in. And these distortions will never be repaired. They can never be healed by just wishing them away. Because you know just as well as I do that when you cover things up, the thing still remains. And so I can't just cover up a broken image because my father lived this way with me. I had a very distant relationship with my father. It still is very distant. And you know well as I do, you can be in the same room with someone and still feel worlds apart. And there are times in my life where I've had to take that image, where I've taken those images of who, how I relate to my earthly father, which is very distant, and we just don't connect, and I project it onto God and think, God doesn't know me. How could God possibly know me? He's so far away, he's so distant. And the thing is, is I cannot just wish that distortion away or cover it up because it still remains. The only way to heal from these broken pictures of who we think God is as a father is to completely replace them with truth. So that's what we have to do today. We have to take a look at what is the truth of who God is. God the Father stands before all of your distorted images, all of your broken images of who he is, and he says to us, don't you ever be so foolish as to measure your love for me with my love for you. Don't you ever compare your thin, pallid, wavering, moody love with my love, for I am God and I am not man. And I love you perfectly. I father you perfectly. And when we are sinking in over our head with different life circumstances, we want to ask God, how deep is your love for me? 
How deep is your love for me? How great is your love really going to be for me? Because I need a father who loves me greatly. And John asks and answers the same question in one of the most affectionate verses in all of scripture as far as I'm concerned. First John chapter three, verse one, where he says, how great is the love the father has lavished on us that we should even be called children of God. And that is what you are. I love this passage. I love that verse because it says not only is the truth the fact that you are fathered by God, God is your father, but it is an incredible love that has been given to you that you could even be called a child of God. That's an incredible reality and a fact. I am fathered by God. It's an incredible fact. It's an incredible truth that we have to really let sink in. Let me show you also in Romans chapter 8 where he begins to show what this looks like. If I really believe the truth that God fathers me, there is a greater reality of what is coming from me in that relationship. In chapter 8 of Romans, uh, let's see, I'm going to start in verse 12. It says, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14, for all you who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. Again, this is stating the fact you are fathered by God. That's just a fact. Verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry out. This is your response. This is our response. As children who are fathered by God, we have within us a spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children, then we are heirs. That means we fall in line with this whole royal wedding. I I can't get get into it. I don't care. So, yeah, I'm just thinking of what it means to be an heir of royalty. And if children, then you are heirs. You are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have come to be a follower of Jesus, this means that you have within you a spirit that is active and spirit that speaks out to us from our very core. But what is that spirit saying? Well, it says if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, you have within you at the very core of who you are is a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. Do you understand at the very core of who you are As a child fathered by God, at the core of who you are is a voice that is who you are that cries out, Abba, Father. This word Abba is not a weird disco band out of the 70s. It is an incredible, you guys never laugh here. I just don't understand. (laughs) Thank you for that. Um, uh, (laughs) So, But this word Abba, especially in this context, is, and you may have heard it said before, it is a very tender word. It is similar to what we would say, at least in English, is is like daddy. And so you would, if you grow up in an English-speaking home, you, uh, the, the child would begin to learn this word. It's often the first word that they would learn, and they learn it slowly. They would say, da, 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 daddy, and they would begin to add those on and add those context on. And it's the same thing in a Hebrew-speaking uh, culture. They would learn their first names or the first words that they would begin to learn is usually Abba, and it is this tender word where they would say Ab, 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 Abba, and eventually they would put it all together. It is a very tender word for Father. And so what we're seeing here is that even within you, at the core of who you are, if you are a follower of Jesus, there is this tender connection with the heart of God at the very core of who you are. Your spirit Your heart, your inner being cries out, Abba, Father. Because your spirit, your heart 
actually understands that you are a child of God. That's just a fact. You are fathered by God. Your very core, your spirit, knows itself as the beloved child of God. Being the beloved child of God is the very core of your existence. It is who you are. As 1 John chapter 3, 1 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what you are. We are child, children of God, but there is a problem, isn't there? Because we wouldn't have a whole series if it was just a fact. We could just we could have written that up. You are a child of God, and we could have all prayed and left. But there's a problem. Because within us is this identity that cries out, Abba, Father, God, my Father. A core inner being understands itself as a child of God, but that spirit, that voice that knows itself as beloved child of God is silenced by all of the other things that we use to define ourselves and all of the broken images that we put on top of it. And we start to disbelieve even to the point where I can't even hear that voice that says, Father, I know myself as Father. Because I've allowed, my other, I've allowed other people, I've allowed broken circumstances in my life, I've allowed my things that have happened in my past to me and things that I've done in my past to others, I've allowed all of those other things to eclipse the cry that is at the core of who I am that says I am fathered by God, I am a child of God and I'm loved by God. I can't even hear that voice sometimes because it grows very faint under the other things that I've thrown on top of it in my life. And I drown it out. And the spirit cries out within us, but few of us hear it. We've listened to too many other things and have allowed too many other things aside from the core of who we are as scripture has defined. We've allowed too many other things to define. You know what? You're not a child of God. You're actually this. And you'll never be more than this. You ain't never going to be more than this. This is what you really are. And we've allowed all of these experiences that we've, ha- that we've walked through to define who we are. And we can't even hear the voice of who we really are speaking out and saying, no, you are a child of God, you are beloved of God, and you are fathered by God. All of the other things that we listen to in order to define who we are grow noisier and noisier, and we develop awareness of who we are only when we can strengthen the cry of the heart of God, the cry of the child of God that's in us, that knows we are fathered. We will only strengthen it in our time connected to the heart of God. Because when we're alone with the Father, we can actually tune out all the rest of this broken life voices that try to define who we are. There's another loud voice. There's this voice that cries out as a child of God that is true of who we are. Romans 8 says that we are children of God, that we are fathered by God. But then we also have another voice. It's very loud. Uh, It's the inner Pharisee that every one of us has. If you read through the Gospels, you see the Pharisees put out there, and you see the way that they live their life, and you start to identify with some things, and you start to realize, I have an inner Pharisee that is so loud, and it shadows the inner child of God that I have within me. It's something I really recognize when I started watching my own children. I have two little girls, six and seven years old, and my girl's expression of emotion is enormous. It is enormous. It is usually irrational. And it is huge. And my girls can, they, they become irritated by the, like, uh, the, sm- the shortest things. And it doesn't take much. It only takes one word from me or one word from my wife or even from anywhere or from anybody else. And they move to dramatic, drastic stages of emotional expression out of nowhere. And my kids can do this in a moment. And it only takes one statement from me. One statement from anyone else and my girls will jump right into the pool of emotion 
with no abandon. Hey, somebody sees me. There is a part of me, there is a part of me that identifies those outbursts, those emotional breakthroughs as dramatic, overly dramatic. They're unreasonable. They're irrational. And that is all Pharisee. You and I like to call it maturity. You and I like to call it adulthood. But it gets to a point where I become irritated by the outbursts of my children and their big feelings. And I devalue their expression. And I devalue their emotion. And we come far down the line of Pharisaic maturity. The Pharisee in me says, you have got to learn to get over this. You've got to get over this. You have got to let these things roll off of you because life ain't going to be easy. Life's going to be really hard. And my inner Pharisee says, grow up and stop whining. But remember, I also have another voice that is true that Scripture says was within me. At the very core of who I am, I have an inner child that is fathered by God and knows how to open myself to other people and refuses to lie to myself regarding all of my loneliness and my sadness and my pain and my insecurities and all of my fears. My inner child hears my girls outbursts and the things that they, they break down and identifies with them entirely. This part of me identifies with them entirely and my inner child screams at me and says, hey, you have fears, you have hurts, you have emotions, but you quit listening. And the moments that I open myself to my own father and share how I feel in all of the moments that have come across in my life, the child of God wins over the Pharisee in me. The moments that I put myself in an open surrender before my father and say, I need you to be my father. I cry out to you because I need you to be close because I'm lonely, I'm hurt, I'm broken, and things aren't working. I need you to be my father. The moments that I allow myself to surrender to that place, those are moments when the child of God that is true of who I am wins over the Pharisee. And these are moments that the Holy Spirit reveals the deepest work in the child of God. But they are not always the moments that you expect. When you look at Matthew chapter 4, you see the desert temptations. It's right after God had, uh, had, had spoken, after, right after Jesus comes out of the water, after being baptized by John, then uh, God speaks and says, this is my child in whom I am well Please, this is my son. So again, it's another fact that is stated. It's just a fact. And they prayed and they closed and they went out from the river. They just left because that, it's just a fact. You are my child and I am proud of you. So he left. And then he went into the wilderness to be tempted. And the desert temptations of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, they all come to the same question. If you are the son of God, then dot, 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 fill in each of the desert temptations. If you are the son of God, and I find it interesting how Satan would be using this question. If you really are the son of God, he would pose that question to Jesus immediately after the father already stated at the Jordan River, yes, he is my son, and I am very pleased with my son. Right after God says, audibly, vocally says, this is my son, I am, how, I am well pleased. And so he goes into the desert and then immediately Satan says, hey, if you really are the son of God, then he gives all of these different temptations. Immediately after God speaks the truth of Jesus' identity as a fathered son of God, Satan comes and launches an attack on his identity. And Satan doesn't change his plan throughout history up until this current day. As soon as you hear the fact of who you are, of who you are as fathered son of God, you are a fathered 
daughter of God. As soon as that happens, you have to understand that there is an enemy that will attack the very identity that has been stated over you. Does Jesus believe strongly enough who the Father says he is? Does Jesus not only trust who God says he is, but does he fully embrace his own identity as the son who is fathered by God? Something happens in the wilderness of our identity, and our identity is at risk in those moments. In the wild desert times of life, we are interpreters of something important. Our wilderness moments are often immediately right after we have been very confident of who we are. And so we enter into a desert moment and an enemy will attack your identity and to see, do you really trust that you are a fathered son of God? Do you really trust that you are a loved and fathered daughter of God? Not all of us are strong enough to emerge from our desert moments in life with a full trust. And some fewer of us have fully embraced this identity as sons and daughters so that they can stand confidently in the face of that question and say, yes, I am a fathered son of God and he is very pleased in me. I am a fathered daughter and he is very pleased with me. Can you walk into the desert moments of your life and still stand confidently in that reality? This has been a challenge for every wilderness that every one of God's children has ever come into and walked through. If you are a son and daughter of God, then you trust and embrace that identity because your father has already told you and spoken over you and you already have a spirit within you that cries out, Abba, Father. I am, I am my father's daughter. I am my father's son and he is very pleased with me. One of the most difficult things for me as a father of young daughters has been uh, this moment that I've probably been the most frustrated. My five-year-old at the time is trying to express all of her feelings, express all of her thoughts, but she's begun using the words that she probably more than likely heard at school. And in those last couple of years, I started to hear the words fat and ugly being stated in my house, and nothing drives me crazier. And in case you're glossing over the details I'm trying to lay out, my five-year-old talked about being fat and ugly. And for the first time that she said that word, I can still remember the moment. The first time we were in the car driving, she was in the back seat, and the first time I heard her say that word, I pulled the car over to the side of the road as if she had said the other F word. And I pulled to the side of the road because that's what you do when your child says something that's so inappropriate and hurtful. And I pulled over to the side of the road and I said, Briley, I do not want to hear you talk about my daughter like that ever again. Do you understand me? And she did. And that word comes up sometimes, but not nearly very often. And I realize self-image, I realize those types of things are going to be issues for the rest of my life as I raise girls and live in a house full of them. I understand to some degree that it comes with the territory, but I also understand how much of that trouble will come from an environment that I facilitate as a father of daughters. And I also realize and understand that a father's words mean worlds to a daughter's heart and to a son's heart. And so I have to understand that as I try to father these little girls that my words mean something huge. The moment that I was first ensnared by the love of God for me is when I actually came to see the Father of Scripture who loves and delights in me, his Son. He comes close to me in a true fellowship when I can find rest and I can actually find healing in the moments of my biggest moments of brokenness. I've come to see that God is not hard to please. He is not difficult to please. And I've come to know his delight and his smile. 
I know that God also will correct me and he will challenge me and he will push me to be the best that I can be. I also know he does that all of it with a smile of a father who is tender and proud of me. And my Abba is proud of me and knows I have come to see and come to trust and come to know that this is a father who knows that I am his imperfect but very promising son. And I see his delighted smile, which I know I am coming to look more and more like my father every day. And when the child of God begins to believe the spirit that is within himself and within herself who actually does cry out, who bears witness as it says that you are a child of God and if you are a child of God, you are an heir of God, a fellow heir with Christ. When a child of God truly listens to a fact that we could have just put up on a screen, that you are a child of God, you are fathered by God, when you start to listen to that truth and realize you are an heir, then you realize that all of the blessings that come with being a child of God is a birthright for you. All of the blessings and the gifts that you experience in the gospel of God's love are not privileges. They are birthrights. They are coming to you because you are a child of God. You are an heir with Christ. Those things are coming to you not because it's a privilege to be a child. It is your birthright. As a follower and a child of God, you have the blessings that come with the gospel. That's what it means to be a, a child of God. For him to be your father, he longs to give you all the blessings that come with being a child of God. And those things await for you if you would start to listen to the true core of who you are, the spirit that is within you, the very core of who you are that cries out, yes, I know I am a child of God. And more importantly, the question then becomes, what difference would it make in your life if you really believed that, like really believed that God fathers you delights in you, is proud of you, is so happy that your heart and your life and the way that you live your life is starting to look more and more like him every day. If you, what would happen in your life if you truly believed that that was real, that that was true? What would change? What would change in your life if that was true? Would you approach God differently than you did this morning if you really believe that there is a heart of hearts and a core of your identity that says, I am a child of God and God is very pleased with me? If you really believe that, what would change in your life if that was true? Because this is all very important. In Hosea chapter 11, verse 9, God says, I am God, I am not man. So you can't keep taking all of the pictures of your broken relationships with other broken people. They could be, you could have the best father in the world, but he's still a broken human being. And all of his best is still a fraction of the love that God has for you. So when we take these broken images and take them away and start to say, how is it that God really fathers me? and guides me, and looks at me, you have to realize, I am not God. I am, I am not man, I am God. This is the way I love you, I love you differently. I'm gonna close with this. If you guys could just close your eyes. I want you to listen to God's words to your heart, and I'll have the worship team come up, um, and we'll close after this. But for a second, um, my, my wife works for the American Lung Association, and she has told me about a lot of the research that they've learned with uh, our breathing and how we breathe, because most of us use only a fraction of our lungs capacity every day because we breathe so shallowly. Uh, and you also know, because you took health class in eighth grade, that oxygen, uh, when we take in oxygen, it, it gives us 
uh, energy. It energizes our blood system, our bloodstream, and it and it helps us live. So for a second, before I read this, with your eyes closed, could you just take a huge breath, bigger than you take normally? Just a huge breath. Fill your chest and your stomach, and let it out. And I want you to listen to these words that are from the heart of God out of Isaiah chapter 43 and 54. And I want you to hear this. Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are precious in my eyes because you are honored and I love you. The mountains may depart, the hills may be shaken, but my love for you will never leave you. And my covenant of peace with you will never be shaken. Let me pray, and then we are going to close with some worship together. God, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for the, just the fact that you are our Father and that we have within us the actual voice that cries out to you as Father. But we also confess that we have a lot of other voices that we listen to to define who we are. So God, today I pray that you would strip away enough of those other broken voices, enough of those other broken pictures of who we think we are, who we've been told who we are, strip away enough of those that we can even hear the faint voice that is true that says, I am a child of God and he is pleased with me. God, let us hear your love for us, maybe in a way we haven't heard it in a long time. Speak to our heart of hearts. And if it has nothing to do with a word I have said, that would be the best. Just let us hear your love today as our fathers, as our Father. Let us hear you, let us see you, and let us not walk out of this building having completely missed you another week. We praise you, God, for who you are. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name.